Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, TV. Well, thank you all uh, for coming to listen uh, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, where, wherever you are. Uh, and you're getting a, a triple header uh, talk on the biological darkening of the green and ice sheet uh, because Alex, Liana and myself were very fortunate to get an ERC synergy grant uh, that we call Deep Purple. Um, I'm more of a chemist. Alex is more of a microbiologist. Uh, Liana is more of a, uh, of a particle geochemist, but we're all very interdisciplinary in, in outlook. Um, and I hope that the story that we're gonna tell you over the next 45 minutes uh, is, is of interest and stays with you. Um, the real stars of the, of the show from the Black and Broom project, which was the forerunner for Deep Purple, uh, were our super smart postdocs, Joe Cook, uh, Janine McCutcheon, Andrew Tedstone, and Chris Williamson. Uh, we were very fortunate to have four really good PhD students, Alex Horland, Steffi Lux, Miranda Nichols, and Urs Sipianska. Uh, the co-PIs on Black and Bloom were John Bamba, Edward Hanna, Andy Hodson, Tris Irvin Flynn, Joe Laban Parry, Jim McQuabe, and Mariam Yallop. Uh, and with a team like that, you just can't go wrong. Other people who have contributed to work in this, um, in this uh, talk are from Deep Purple uh, and, and associated with Deep Purple. So thanks to James Bradley, Lassie Dane, Eva Doting, Laura ha Halbach, Ray Moreau, Laura Perini and Tr Trista Vady. And then um, way back in 2014, Jason Box and Marek Stibble with the Dark Snow Project were really, really helpful in getting Black and Bloom uh, going. And without them, uh, there'd be no Black and Bloom, there'd be no Deep Purple. So we'll, we'll pay the dues as we're, uh, as we're going along. So the biological darkening of the, uh, of the Greenland ice sheet. Well, the, the, main, the main theme to our work is, is what's controlling the annual growth of the dark zone along the western margin of the ice sheet. Um, the image to the left-hand side um, the image to the left hand side shows albedo changes from 1981 to 2000 and you see not much, not, not much has changed and yet for the next 12 years from 2000 to 2012 you can see that there's a dark band that's grown down the western margin of the, uh, of the ice sheet. It, the change in albedo is up to, to 0.1 on on a zero to one scale, ten percent is quite a um, is quite a big uh, big change. The physical changes are, are are not alone are not enough to explain this decrease in albedo. So as the climate's warming and the melt zone is expanding, that expansion of the melt zone and the uh, and the exposure of bare ice surface alone is not enough to control the decrease in albedo. Andrew Tedson did some lovely work back in 2017 uh, to show that the extent and the intensity of the, uh, of the dark zone changes on an annual basis. So the, the red patch shows you the, uh, the, the uh, albedo of the, uh, the southwest sector of the, of the ice sheet. And the darker the red, the, the longer is the albedo dark and less than uh, the 0 point, 0 0.45. And you can see that from 2000 through to 2016, there are, there are different extents and different intensities of, uh, of darkness of the, uh, of the southwestern sector. And in particular, 2010, 2012, 2016 uh, are, are, are quite dark years and they, and they are also warm years. Much of the work that we're going to show you uh, is going to be from the, uh, the S6 zone near, uh, near Kangalusak. Uh, we're out in the dark zone. Uh, Marek Stibble, uh, Jason Box and the, uh, and the dark snow team were really, really helpful. They, taught, they enabled Black and Bloom to, uh, to colonize this area. 
and then for the next three seasons we uh, we camped on the on the area trying to understand what you might think would, would be a, a uniformly white uh, ice surface actually actually you know the more you look at the picture the more you convince yourself that the ice surface is dark rather than uh, rather than black um, and the black and bloom camp uh, you know, we occupied this for 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 the next three uh, for 2016 to 2018. To give you uh, some idea of uh, of scale, uh, the ice sheet margin, the bare ice, varies from 30 to 60 or so uh, so kilometres. Uh, the dark zone grows, maybe 10 kilometres or so from the ice sheet margin, where the uh, where the ice is flatter. Uh, and with the eye of faith, you go from dark through uh, through to white at the, at the snow line, and you can maybe believe in a, in a time for space substitution that over time the ice surface is getting darker and darker. If you drill into uh, the detail of the darkening a little bit, uh, and here the length scale is uh, is a kilometer, we're still in the dark zone, and you could maybe see the banding. Uh, present in the uh, in the ice, and you could maybe believe that that might be Holocene dust layers that are melting out of the ice sheet surface uh, and contributing to the uh, to the to the uh, to the properties of the dark zone. If you go down in scale a little bit further, and this is of the order of uh, of uh, fifty meters now, again you know you can see pervasive patches of darkness often on topographic lows and you can see that the topographic highs often are uh, are quite uh, are quite bright and then finally if you uh, you drill down to you know the run to take a photograph down around your uh, your feet um, this length scale is uh, is about uh, about 10 centimeters again you're just you're just surprised even on the uh, on length scales of a meter you walk from patches of relatively clean snow to patches of snow that contain a lot of dispersed cryoconite to patches of snow that uh, that are off white uh, and one thing that strikes you on a on a small scale is just how variable the ice surface is um, and you know we'll come to see that the the physical characteristics of the melting ice surface known as the as the weathering crust are, are, are very variable and may have a big impact on the surface albedo. Now what are the sources of, uh, of darkening? Um, well 2014 or so uh, folks thought that maybe the dark zone was formed from tundra dust blowing up onto the ice sheet uh, maybe it was melt out the dust bands, particularly uh, Holocene dust rich uh, ice bands. It was thought that maybe in these, these, uh, these flatter areas there was ponded melt water or, or more water laden ice. There was an idea uh, that maybe it was black carbon deposited uh, from the atmosphere. Uh, I'll show you a slide of that just in a moment. And the idea that that biology had anything to do with the, uh, the darkening of the ice sheet surface was kind of laughed off the park. So in 2016, we went to a meeting in, uh, in Gothenburg and the ice sheet modelers to a person told me I was totally bonkers thinking that uh, there was any biology of any consequence on the, uh, on the ice sheet surface. So the, uh, the earlier idea was it's gotta be dust, it's gotta be, uh, gotta be black soot. If you if you scrape the uh, the surface ice from the the ice sheet, you it's 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 relatively rare to find to find quite clean ice. It becomes increasingly common to find really dirty ice, and when you melt and filter that material, it really does look black. And one could easily imagine that that would be tundra fires, for example, in nor north uh, northern and America. Uh, where the soot was uh, was blowing over onto the ice sheet and then darkening the ice, but if you if you take a look uh, down a microscope, um, as Marek Stibble de did, as um, as uh, as uh, the Black and Bloom team have, have done, you find that a lot of that material is pigmented purple glacier ice algae. 
And indeed, a lot of the inorganic material looks pretty translucent. So a lot of that darkening is, uh, is down to, uh, to growing purple glacier ice, ice algae. And here's some of the provisional data from the Dark Snow project that Marek Stibble uh, kindly loaned to us to, to make the Black and Bloom presentation that got us our, our first grant. And here you see the concentration of glacier algal cells per mil. Alex will come back to this in a, in a moment, but we're up to 10 to the 5 cells per mil. And you can see that the albedo of the ice sheet surface goes down and you know when I, I started this I simply didn't believe that you could get albedos of 0.4 down to 0.2 and John Bamba I always remember telling me it's almost like one of the darkest natural surfaces on the planet the the oceans uh, so more cells more 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 darkness and I think over the uh, over the uh, recent years there then it's become part of the folklore of um, of albedo decline on the uh, on the ice sheet. It, it, it's it's glacier ice algae growing and blooming that are darkening the ice sheet surface. What we learned from Black and Bloom was uh, was uh, how to do the job. We learned a lot about uh, site uh, S six near uh, near Kangalusak, um, and. Deep Purple has given us the opportunity to, uh, to look at uh, the processes that we, that we think we know in, in more detail and to understand how they, how they might be distributed uh, around the green and ice sheet in a, in a warming world. And, and we think that if you're interested in uh, albedo and darkening of the ice sheet, you need to know about glacier ice algal growth you need to know something about mineral algae interactions. You need to know something about nutrient dynamics. And in particular, then you need to know about particulate bio mining. You need to know something about the environment in which the glacier ice algae are growing. And that's the weathering crust. Um, and I'll, I'll finish off by, um, by uh, saying a little, little bit about why we think the weathering crust is, uh, is important. And what I'm going to do now is to uh, is to pass you over to Alex. Thanks, Martin. That's really nice. Uh, and thanks everyone for being here. And then I'm just going to start to uh, the slides for this one. And then uh, I jumped a few. And here we are. So as Martin alluded, so we, we, I'm, I'm going to start to, to talk a little bit about the glacial algae uh, aspect of these uh, interactions between the weather crust and the particles and then, and then the biology part. So uh, I'm aware that I'm talking to, to glaciologists. Most of you are glaciologists and, 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 and maybe you, you have not looked at the environment that you are working on as a biological entity. But reality is that this is a, this is a massive biome. It, it's, it's, uh, it occupies a huge part of the, the planet and then um, uh, sort of a significant part of the planet and, and, and has this my sort of biological community that it's, um, that's unique uh, just like it fits any definition of a biome. So you have this, um, uh, you have a community of plants and animals that, uh, that are occupy a distinct region, they interact with each other, and they have this feedback with the physical chemical uh, environment that they live in. And here I'm just showing sort of the plants, the vegetation of the, this uh, glacial biome uh, that fits in with this talk. Uh, and I particularly am going to concentrate on, this, um, on these guys here, this particular group of algae here that they are, you see are very pigmented, very dark. Um, and as Martin have said, so if you scrape a little bit of the surface ice that is dark and you have lots of these guys here. It's quite interesting because as a biome, so it's as any biome, you have a diverse um, 
sort of range of organisms that live on glaciers that are unique and then uh, and that live there and but if you look at this vegetation this part that is the vegetation the algae that is living on the surface of the ice actually they are not very diverse so if i show this um, this slide here this is a, a paper from one of the postdocs in black and bloom Steffi lutz that she did in addition to the microscopy. So we are looking as well as the genetic diversity of the algal community that is living on the surface of the ice. And about, so these are samples collected in the um, Kangulusuak area on the Greenland ice sheet. And it's, um, it's about 85% of the community is actually composed by one single group of algae. So extremely well adapted. And they are extremely abundant as well. So the numbers that I'm showing here, they are actually very, very much comparable to very productive systems on, a, on a sort of productive lakes and, and so on. So um, Martin showed also this picture, this correlation between the albedo and the, the cells. And this is also shown by um, one of the postdocs of um, Black and Bloom, Joe Cook. And um, and what is interesting here is to think about that when you when you scrape the surface of the ice and you melt that surface, just one milliliter of uh, of that surface of ice contains normally a lot of cells. So and some of those surfaces have a hundred to to a thousand cells in one milliliter. That's enough already to result in a decrease in albedo of zero point two. But a lot of the surface actually have concentration loads up to 100,000 cells in one milliliter and then causing a depression of albedo of up to 0 0.6. And they are not only there, they are actually very active as well, this, uh, this, uh, the, the algae that's living there. Um, so this is all the, the couple of papers that try to look at activity. So these are the photosynthetic rates of the, the algae living on the ice. So they are, uh, because they are just like vegetation, so they, of course, they do photosynthesis and you can measure that as a measure of activity. And then if you take this approach that they're just collecting different types of ice that have different loads of concentration of cells, you can actually find that the productivity here, it's of course increased with more the darker the ice, the more productive is the ice. So there's more active that is related to the number of cells. And the numbers here are exactly what you would find in a very productive green lake, in a so very, very eutrophic lake. So this is it's extremely, not only abundant microbes on the ice, but they are also very active. And I guess that one interesting thing about the biology of them, I mean, so we are talking about, again, algae that uh, do photosynthesis. So they, uh, they are like plants and we always perceive plants as green, but these guys are brown, purple. So that's, um, uh, and that's interesting because of course that coloration is also giving um, uh, the origin for the, the, the darkening of that ice. And when you, so that paper from uh, Chris Williamson, that is recent published, kind of go and then try to characterize that pigmentation quite well. And it's about more than 2%, and this is a lot of the dry weight of the cells, is uh, has a, a, this phenolic pigmentation that, it's, um, that has this sort of composition. So it's uh, just like what you find in, in uh, plants like black tea, sort of. So that's, um, that's a poporigaline-like pigment. And, uh, and there's a reason for why they are there. So the, the ice environment is, it's, receives a lot of radiation. There's a lot of uh, sort of scattering of lights and so on, and that can damage quite well the cells. So this provides a really nice protection for, for the algae. And, um, and that's quite nicely showing this experiment here that uh, you, you probably can observe that the ice algae here in green, so this is when they are receiving the full light. So this is their sort of a measure of their photosynthetic uh, efficiency and so on. So they have this uh, sort of 
behave here, but if you shade them, remove some of that light, so they perform much better. So that gives an indication of the light stress that they are subject on the ice, and that's why they have to form have those pigments. And the good thing about the pigments as well is that it's absorbing that radiation and dissipating as heat, and that heat is also generating melts and then a more aquatic habitat for the algae itself. So as a biologist, we are interested in, in um, kind of uh, looking at the life cycle of the algae. It's very important for us to understand the controls and then how they behave, what the, the needs and so on, why they are so successful in the ice environment. Uh, so usually when we get these algae uh, from the field, so they look very, very nice here, really nice brown. They are even kind of here conjugating. So this is how they reproduce too. Then you bring them to the lab and then that's it. So they are, they are usually dying and they, they don't behave at all in the lab. So we cannot investigate the life cycle as we would like it by having cultures of them. So this slide is it's empty because it represents the frustration of not being able to culture them. I think we are having, we have had a few steps forward recently, but uh, we are still kind of don't want <laughs> to dare to say too much, but we are in that condition at the moment. But um, one way to, to investigate their life cycle is of course, is to look at their behavior at different uh, parts of the season. Um, and then the transitions are particularly good to, to investigate the ice algae. So uh, we have been lucky enough to be during the, the springtime, collecting um, the ice algae. Uh, the glacial ice algae under the, the snowpack. And then, uh, and what we can see is that these are a layer from the previous year that is frozen, of course, and then it's covered by snow. And they are still keep their pigments. A lot of them, they are not, they, they are not extremely abundant, but we have evidence that they are active already. So they are pigment active. And then, and therefore, I mean, if you could imagine our red radiation being able to penetrate through the snow and being absorbed by the ice algae and then already generate some melting at the springtime because their presence are there. So this is quite interesting. We know, so, and then we know a little bit about the summer because that's when we make most investigations and we know extremely little about the transition to the freezing stage at the end of the season. Um, but sometimes we can investigate that through the fact that when you bring to the lab, we could imagine that that's the, the phase that they are starting to degrade and so on. And we have some uh, strides on that. There's a postdoc and deep purple project now. Um, currently work on the fungal community associated with the, the ice algae, the glacial ice algae, to give an indication that some groups of fungi are actually very successful at the end of the, at that phase that they are degrading the lab. And that could be given an indication to what is happening during the winter or during the freezing season. We know actually nothing about the winter because no one has collected samples from the winter as far as I know. Um, so these are giving an, an indication of potentially biological controls. And I know that people are, do, do not want to talk about viruses at the moment, but uh, actually viruses, in addition to be a nuisance, as we all know now, um, to humans, they, uh, they also infect any type of organisms, any type of organism in our planet. And they, of course, there's very likely to be a virus that are infecting the ice algae as well. Uh, but we know nothing about that yet. But that's one of the objectives as well in Deep Purple now. Um, so in addition to those controls, you can imagine another sort of physical chemical controls. We alluded to the light aspect controlling the sort of the physiology of the uh, glacial ice algae. Um, and then the potentially biological controls. But then... Um, uh, Previously, I read, so Beric during the Dark Snow project, uh, Merrick and Jason, they, they, they also showed quite nicely that rain, so precipitation could be a potential interesting control, physical control of the, the ice algae because of the, how they redistribute them and so on. 
So here this just showing that uh, sort of precipitation events usually have an impact in reduce the number of ice algae. And then this is the correlation of them growing back again after, after days since the precipitation event. So there's a small correlation there, but significant correlation. The other thing to take into consideration is that all organisms, all biological entities, they need uh, nutrients uh, to survive. So if they need nutrients, so that could be a potential control. And in a glacial environment, in an ice sheet, where those nutrients are coming from, and that's where I leave to Leanne Benning, who is going to talk a little bit more about those aspects. So I pass on to her now. Thank you, Alex. So uh, basically, um, we want to understand how the nutrients actually can feed the algae and actually to a bloom. But in order to do that, we have first to ask ourselves where do the nutrients come from? What is the dynamics? And whether and if the microbes actually biomine these nutrients somehow maybe from the minerals. So one of the things which we are looking at is uh, they come from the air. We start with delivery from the air. And what we have done is we basically look at collecting a bunch of aerosols. So what you see in this picture here, you see that we have a, a system where we have a, a real time sensors, like for example, our optical particle counters or ethylometers to measure black carbon. And we have a bunch of filters which collect both black carbon, but also minerals. And that means we collect them in a variety of ways to analyze their characteristics from the point of view of the minerals, the nutrients, the microbes, and the black carbon. And this is work primarily driven by Janine McCutcheon's work, which uh, was a postdoc with me in Leeds before I moved to Germany, and now is a junior faculty member at the University of Waterloo. And my colleague, Jim McQuaid, uh, who is uh, still a, a, a lecturer in the universe, at the University of Leeds. And then we collected filters at a slow flow rate at about 20 liters per minute and also at a very fast flow rate at about 300 liters per minute to actually also do the biology of whatever is delivered to the ice sheet. Now, one of the things you have to remember is that when uh, you actually do this, what you see is that you have a, a you can have dry deposition, that means you're collected from the air, but obviously you collect also have wet deposition, which is either by snow or like Alex also mentioned by rain. So we actually collected all these samples and what I show you here is an example of uh, one sample where we actually collect them on the filter. And this is the work by Satish Mayana who actually cut, measured in this particular sample 30,000 particles. So this N is about 30,000 to work out the mean particle diameter of these particles. And what you see is that they are all around about one micron. So they're really, really tiny. These are the, uh, the ones from the air. We've done this from multiple samples, also from the air and also from the snow. And the mean part particle is always about one micron. Yes, we have a bunch of big particles as well. That is not surprising, but the majority is by far the small ones. And what you see here is a transmission electron microscopy grid. So this is a net of mesh carbons on which you see two minerals which we can analyze. And now you are down to remember the scale that Martin came down from like Greenland all the way to centimeters. Now you're down to about one micron. And these are minerals which we can analyze. That means we can actually analyze their composition fairly precisely, both what is from the air and what comes from uh, uh, sort of like the, the ground when it's landing. Like uh, Martin mentioned, the second big parameter is obviously black carbon, or let's call it soot, because obviously there are different types of uh, black carbon soot, whether they are coming from wildfire burning or whether they're coming from uh, fossil fuel burning. But basically now you're down to a 300 nanometer scale, where you see that these, these particles, they form these aggregates, up to about 800 nanometer aggregates of these nanoparticles. And if you want to look at any individual nanoparticle, now you, this is down to a scale of five nanometers. And you see this, what is called turbostratic growth ring, which is basically like an onion ring. And this is what a soot particle looks like. Now, the problem is that if you then look at the rest, what is developed, uh, deposited on these things, you see now, this is a filter with a scale, of, uh, with a, a hole here of about 200 nanometers. In this little white ring, you see a bunch of nanoparticles. 
And then you see now the scale, but it's three microns. And this is just the tip of a bacterium. So actually, you see that if you measure carbon total on this filter, you would actually measure a huge amount of carbon from the microbes and a small amount of carbon from the black carbon. But actually, because the carbon is black, it will make a huge effect on the any albedo measurement. In the microbes, we also analyze them. Like I said, it's mostly bacteria, fungi, and pollen, and rarely do we see the algae. But then you ask yourself, how do we go from something which is as beautiful as white as everybody expects green and is, to something like this? And how do we actually measure these changes in a way that we can help predict melt rates? Because we go from something super clean to something super dirty. So what we can do is we can say, well, let's look at the transition. Because like Martin mentioned, we could have input from the air, but we could also have melt out from these Holocene dust bands. We don't know that. But this is now a transition. And what you see here is humans for scale. And you see that it's a transition from snow. And in this particular case, it's dominated by red snow algae. Then you go to the melt zone, and you get into really, really dark black ice, which is containing the, the algae that Alex spoke about. And it contains, uh, basically, you see these little pockets, which is a mixture of algae and minerals. So when you look at that, from going from very clean to very dispersed biofilms to then these particles, and you've seen this picture before from Martin, you ask yourself, how is this process actually happening? What actually is going on in terms of the minerals themselves? Who is there and what happens? And basically what you have to ask yourself is like, how do we go about? So you collect those little specks in the, in the ice, and you then basically analyze to see how, uh, what actually happens from those minerals. And remember, we measured from the air that the particle size distribution is one micron, but what you get on the ground is actually something like this. This is not one micron, the scale bar now is 500 microns. So what you see here, these are clumps and aggregates of these um, minerals and microbes together, which form these aggregates, which all land in these little pockets. Now, you still ask yourself, well, what is actually happening? And if you want to then look at the mineral part of this thing, because we are asking what feeds these microbes to grow like that. So obviously, you analyze the mineralogy. And don't be, and again, I know that many of you are glaciologists, but and that's the reason why I made this very small, because the detail of this diffraction pattern, this is a mineralogical X-ray diffraction pattern, do not matter. The only thing which is important that in the samples which we collected off Kangaluswak, we have up to 21 different minerals. Now, Martin already alluded that many of these minerals do not contribute a lot to the albedo because they are mostly translucent. They contribute much less than the pigment and algae. But our question was, where are the nutrients? So we analyzed that and we actually realized that less than, far less than 0.1 weight percent of all these minerals contain phosphorus, which is one of the nutrients which they're really after. And we were asking ourselves, well, okay, if they have a little bit of nutrients, that may be enough. Second question from the point of view of the mineralogy is where do they come from? Where does this dust come from? Because it could, like Martin said, it could be from in front of the glacier. It could be from underneath the glacier, but it could also be very, very far long range transport. It could be from Asia, it could be from Africa, the African deserts, because that also happens. So what we've done, we analyzed the geochemistry, we analyzed the rare earth element composition. And again, the, the details don't matter here. You'll see this is at the moment in press in nature communications. But most of our samples fall in the area which is representing Greenland lithologies. There may be a little contribution from Asia and Africa, but mostly it's Greenland. So it's actually local provenance. It comes from the fourth field in front of the Kangaluswak. This is, this is our uh, field site. These are the glaciers, and this is the Greenland, the western coast of Greenland. Now, whether it comes from here or from underneath, we don't know. Because part of the melting out of the Holocene, if it's Holocene dust, could also have a contribution from the Greenland bedrocks. That means it could be both. But this is still a part which we need to figure out where exactly, whether it's just local. But most of it is actually Greenland. But now that we know that we have minerals, we have minerals which contain phosphorus, and we asked, how do they feed the microbes? You've seen these pictures before. And this is where you see where the microbes are really happy and super, super 
sort of like very plump and really happy, but you see that they are actually together with a lot of minerals. And if you now go back to the high resolution image, you actually see that they form these really mesh, mesh networks of exudates that they throw out, that they bind themselves to minerals. And what they do when they metabolize, they actually have to produce a bunch of organic acids and a bunch of uh, sort of uh, sugars which to bind them. And that's a way for them to also biomine these. Now, if you look at this scale again, we are now back at the one to three micron scale. So the combination of these minerals and the microbes, if you now want to look at the minerals, the organic part itself, you realize that actually only three to six weight percent of the dry weight is actually organic matter. 95% is actually mineral fraction. Now, this organic matter includes obviously the black carbon. It's a very, very small proportion of that. And it includes what I call microbes, but these could be alive, recently dead, long ago dead, or it could be any kind of organic matter. So it's all in one go. So at the moment, we're working on a project to actually figure out what the different composition is, but that's not part of this discussion. But importantly, if you now look at the organic carbon itself and analyze what actually the organic phosphorus, the organic nitrogen, and the organic uh, uh, carbon actually do, you realize that there's a very clear correlation for all of these organic components, which are proxies for biomass change with the mineral phosphorus. So you see that the mineral phosphorus grows very nicely and very long. So even a small proportion actually makes it grow very long. I'm a microscopist, I'm in a mineralogist, so we went to hunt for where this is because obviously we realized this link tells us that the algae biomine the phosphorus from the minerals for their growth. And that's a very important finding because basically we know that phosphorus is something which they, they lack because there is no phosphorus coming from anywhere except from the minerals. So we mapped all our samples, these filters, let, think about it, we mapped it at six millimeters square and counted between about 300 and 30,000 particles to find the 0.01% uh, phosphorus because that's important to actually look at them. So what you see here is, this is work by Vladimir Odatis, is a map, this is 20 microns now, and the colors, obviously it's false colored, are different minerals. And in this particular sample, we found one calcium phosphate mineral. You see, this is a map for calcium, this is a map, this is elemental maps for calcium and phosphate. And if you put them together, you realize that there is a little shadow, I don't know if you see that, but it is a little bit calcium, which is most likely a feldspar, but there is no phosphorus there. So there is one calcium phosphate mineral. If you look at it at a high resolution, you see that this is typical hydroxyapatite, which actually is very wedded on one side, and that's what we are actually looking for. So we have now means to actually do this on a larger scale because this is important to understand what all the minerals are. And we are now trying also to look for other nutrients, for example, minerals which contain maybe other elements which are important, especially the toxic and trace metals. And I want to finish because basically the same way like Alex finished, we now know a little bit about nutrients and we know a lot also about the liquid, the, the aqueous nutrients, but I haven't gone into that. We know about microbes, we know a little bit about the minerals, but we know very little A about how this happens in 3D. What happens when it freezes in and when it melts out? That means the snow ice microbe mineral interface needs to tell us something about the structure of the weathering crust, which Martin will take over in a moment, and how this happens with seasonal. So we have collected these bunch of ice cores, and this is the work from a PhD student, Ray Moreau, who has just started with us, but he was lucky that he's, he went with us in the summer to Greenland to collect these ice cores. And so we collected a bunch of ice cores, and what he's doing, he's trying to develop ways to analyze these ice cores in three dimensions from the large scale of a core all the way to the individual gray scale. And so what, is the, what we are doing, we're using cryo computer tomography at the whole core scale or at the slice scale, to look at the snow ice crystal structure and also the bubbles because that tells us something about how these crystals, how these interfaces form and reform. But it will also tell us about the micro mineral distribution in the snow ice columns. And if we then look it all the way to bring it to cryo SEM and cryo TM, we actually also look at the interactions between these things. 
and we also collected the surface ice during the melt season. So this is a melt surface of the ice core. This is the weathering crust in an ice core. So when we collect this, you see the black particles here are all the minerals and the pigmented algae. So we can actually now have these samples, put them in a cryo and actually really look at how the rearrangement and what happens compared to when it's frozen in at the end of the season, compared to what happens in the spring, in the summer, and actually to close the circle. And therefore, we also have ways to look at spectroscopy for nutrient accumulation. Because only by combining this can we help to actually understand the cycling of the nutrients and this interface to, towards the weathering crust. And I'll not pass to Martin because basically all of this, we do this as part of Deep Purple to actually understand how this changing in the surface during the summer and during the winter actually help us understand albedo and the weathering crust. Martin, back over to you. Thank you, Liana. Um, okay, and let me share my screen. My screen is here. Unmute myself. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you very much. Now we've been going about forty minutes, so for the last five, uh, the last five minutes, uh, I, I, I want to talk to you about the impact on on runoff and um, and why we think there might be interesting things to to look at in the uh, in the weathering crust. Um, what I want to do is uh, bring to your attention to uh, two great papers by, uh, by Joe Cook and Andrew Tedstone. Uh, they were published in the cry cryosphere. Um, and I'm a, I'm a non-specialist. Uh, I'm a non-specialist here, so, so please bear, uh, bear with me. Um, so Joe's paper, uh, what he did was to use a combination of field uh, spectroscopy, uh, field algal and mineral counts and a radiative transfer uh, model to determine just how much energy the glacier algae were uh, were absorbing and how much they were uh, they were melt they were producing. Um, he put together a supervised uh, classification screen based on drone imagery. Um, we used a, a beg your pardon pointer options. Uh, and we used a, uh, a, 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 a section of the ice surface, about 250 by 250 uh, meters, which is, the, which is a, a, a satellite pixel scale for, for, for our particular area. Um, and on that basis, he was able to take uh, maps of al albedo and uh, put together drapes of uh, of different surface classes containing different amounts of um, of uh, of glacier uh, of glacier ice algae, um, and then he put all that information into a uh, into a melt model and came up with a number that uh, that the algae alone uh, conservative and this is a conservative estimate produce up to 13 to 15 percent of, uh, of, of melting. So the glacier ice algae contribution to melt in this sector of, the, of uh, southwest Greenland conservatively is up to 13 to 15 percent. And in passing uh, he notes that 26 percent or so melt can produce, be produced in cert certain localized patches. So, so the glacier ice algae are, are having a, a significant impact on the amount of melt that's occurring. Um, here's a lovely diagram from a paper by Cooper et al. again in the, uh, in the uh, cryosphere that gives you an idea of what the weathering crust is. So the melting ice surface of the, of the, uh, of the ice sheet isn't uh, homogeneous, it's, uh, it's heterogeneous. You can see that the, uh, the porosity increases as you go as you uh, as 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 you go down into the uh, into the meteoric ice, there's lots of water held within uh, within vein networks. There are big crystal changes, uh, and all these these impacts have an indirect effect on the albedo of the Earth's surface uh, of the glacier surface as well. Now, Andrew is uh, nothing if not if not forensic. Uh, and went down to 20 by 20 uh, meter scales to look at, for example, uh, how different 
different surface classes uh, have different uh, elevations. So, so here's a superglacial stream at a relatively low elevation of, of uh, minus 0.2 meters. Snow is up at uh, zero or so. Clear ice just below. And increasingly, as the algal load in the surface uh, layer increases, so there's a topographic depression. And the biggest, um, the biggest topographic depression occurs where there's cryconite, the, the, the black coarse material that you find at the bottom of, uh, of surface uh, depressions. Now, one of his big observations, and I, I'm sorry, this is um, such a poor, uh, poor fly-in, but, but it's not the glacier algae alone that are controlling the surface, surface albedo. Um, particularly when they're high turbulent heat fluxes, where, you know, when it's very windy, the, the weathering crust can be stripped away. And then other al al albedo effective uh, processes take over. Uh, and these, these relate to the changes in density of porosity and the, and the, uh, the amount of water held interstitially or ponded in the, uh, in the, weathering, uh, in the weathering crust. And an observation of, uh, of his is that his analysis concluded that, that the indirect effects of, of glacier algae on the, on the architecture of the, um, of the weathering crust might be of a similar order to the direct effects. But, but both Andrew and Joe have, uh, have cautioned me to tell you that untangling the direct and indirect effects of the, uh, of the, of the uh, glacier ice algae on the weathering crust are very difficult. And that's one of the big, um, the big things that we want to do in the new Deep Purple project. So watch this space. Uh, we'll be doing more work on the weathering crust, and we think that the weathering crust might be a player in um, in uh, in uh, melt production. So, use a cautionary note about uh, about what the future might hold. Um, you probably all saw that in 2019 it was a very hot year. Um, if you look at the uh, at the medium melt extent in July, that was. Uh, that was blown away. 60% of the ice sheet surface uh, was uh, was melting. Temperatures in the centre of the ice sheet, you know, got from four to eight degrees C or or so. Um, and some might say that this is uh, a, a portent of uh, of the future of melting across Greenland. And so, what Deep Purple will need to do then over the next five years is to is to l look at whether or not the dark zone will, uh, will expand. Um, we note that we're dealing with one of the least studies of, uh, of Earth's biomes. We know a lot, for example, about S6, but, but, but precious little about, about most other places. Uh, what we are aiming to do is to discover the fundamental controls on the, uh, on the growth of the glacier ice algae across the ice sheet. Um, and um, what we hope all this fieldwork will do will make a contribution to, to future albedo parameterization that will allow us to better predict the, uh, the future melt rates from the green and ice sheet. So uh, before I, uh, I sign out, Tavies asked me to uh, pl plug Dan Shapiro's uh, talk for next week. It's on ice pack, a new package for modeling glacier flow. Uh, and you'll be getting more information on, uh, on that over the coming week by email. And with that, I'm going to sign out and ask if you've got any questions. And thanks so much for bearing with us these last uh, 48 minutes. Yeah, Martin, I can see that actually people have had questions in the chat. Um, do, you know, do you know how to deal with that technology? Yes, so, I do. <laughs> Tavi do it. Uh, Tavi just asked me. Uh, this is Hester. Oh, yes, uh, Tavi just uh, Tavi's internet is rubbish. That's her words. So she asked me to actually host the the questions. So what yeah. I'll do is I'll I'll decide which questions. But first of all, thank you, Martin, Alex, and Leanne for really nice talk. Um, there was a first question 
from Jillian, but that was already answered. So the next person that had a question was Melissa Diaz. So if Melissa wants to unmute herself and ask the question. Hi. Um, hi, all. Great talk. It was really interesting. Um, I just had hopefully a, a quick question. Um, so Leanna, I was wondering if the microbes that are, are chelating some of these particles are preferentially choosing um, particles that were recently deposited, or if these are potentially particles that have come up in the ablation zone? Uh, that's a very, very good question, and the answer is we don't know, because basically, uh, if you think of uh, a mineral, let's assume it's a hydroxyapatite, how would you, dis you cannot differentiate a hydroxyapatite, which is delivered by air yesterday, or a hydroxyapatite, which is melting out of the ice from 10,000 years ago. But also, we are not quite sure about the chelating effect, as you mentioned, because basically for solubilizing hydroxyapatite, you just need to uh, uh, change the, the pH conditions primarily, and then you chelate actually, strangely, the calcium and not the phosphorus, so you liberate the phosphorus. But I don't think we know exactly those details yet, because like Matt, Alex said, if we could uh, culture the algae properly, we can actually do these tests in the lab. And that's one of the works pro packages that we are really pushing with Deep Purple to try to figure out how we can actually test with synthetic systems in the lab once we culture this algae. We can do it now with snow algae, but not yet with the ice algae. Uh, thanks. I have a, a follow-up question. Um, so for these experiments, is there the potential to do them directly on the ice sheet? <laughs> Uh, we have tried multiple times doing various fertilization experiments and incubation experiments and obviously some work better than others and maybe Alex wants to talk. I mean, we've tried fertilization experiments since the first day I walked on a glacier because I thought that should be easy. It's not. <laughs> it's very much not. But I think, uh, you know, you can always do experiments in the field, but you have to be very wary that there are so many parameters which change at the same time. Like this year, we had uh, snow events. We had, sorry, we had, we had massive rain events. We had massive wind events. Uh, so you have a lot of heterogeneity, which changes very fast. But we will not give up. We will do them again. I don't know, Alex, maybe you want to compliment. Yeah, no, we, we have been trying so many times in so many different scales to make sure that, okay, so maybe we should have a large scale. So this year, actually, we, one of the PhD students have set up a, a relatively large fertilization experiment, spraying nutrients every day on the ice, in plots of the ice. And then the problem that is, this is what Leon was saying about the, you have a rain event and then suddenly everything changed the aspect of the ice surface. And then something that you have added as a control of of course, not a lot of uh, ice algae here, so let's add nutrients and then suddenly start to melt and then you realize that, oh, actually below that ice layer, there is, as it melts, actually it's quite dark and everything, and then everything changed to clear and then dark is extremely dynamic. Uh, so the bottle experiments are the ones giving the best results at the moment is that when you melt the ice, put in a bottle and then you add nutrients and then you, we try to, it's not ideal, but it's, um, but probably it's less problematic than try to fertilize the ice. Yeah, so you measure things like activity yeah. and you measure things yeah. like changes in a particular uh, relatively contained environment, because we tried all kinds of ways of containing the environment in yeah. boxes, in all kinds of things, but it's really, we are actually introducing more disturbances on the ice than actually letting them do what they do. So, like I said, we still have, we are at the beginning of, the, of, black, of Deep Purple and we'll have many more years to go, so we will not giving up, but that's one of the questions which is really difficult to judge because if we would know what we could do in the lab with these things, it would also be easier to target experiments in the field because we know it works in the lab and then we could go in the field, but because we don't know that, we have to do both at the same time. For sure, thanks, thanks so much. So this is a really good, a good example of a multidisciplinary research where everybody needs everybody else to actually figure out and keep focused. So our next question is from a glaciologist, Pete Nino. Hi folks. Um, yeah, so I've got a question. It was really asking, so what are the circumstances that could result in this albedo uh, algal reduction spreading to a much larger area of the ice sheet? 
and thus amplifying the significance for wider ice sheet wide surface mass balance as opposed to being restricted to the southwest sector because obviously a 20 10 to 20 percent change over 10 percent of the ice sheet isn't that significant a 10 to 20 percent change over a huge proportion of the ice sheet is do you want me to have, do you want me to have a start, first stab at that and then you can all have a laugh at how, uh, how wrong i am um so I think it's the number of melt days, Pete. This is just off the top of my head. I, so the, the, as long as the ice sheet is relatively flat and will hold surface water, then it's the number of, uh, of, uh, of melt days where there's no significant refreezing overnight. And let's say that that number of days might be three, it might be five, but that's sufficient to, to get the ice algae growing. And so if the melt season is, uh, is, is long enough, then over time and year on year, you'll get an accumulation of, uh, of ice algae on, those, on, those, um, on those, uh, those flat interior ice sheet surfaces. Um, do they get enough nutrient? Uh, they don't need a lot of nutrient. And you know, Alex calls them carbon factories. So as long as they've got a little bit of phosphorus, uh, they seem to be able to get by um, and in high light intensities they they seem to require even like less um, uh, nutrient than you might otherwise uh, imagine so for all style, old style geochemists you think that they've got to have a fixed CNP ratio uh, and, in, and in fact that ratio is very plastic when they get stretched uh, stressed up they they need less carbon and less nitrogen uh, and less phosphorus you know, bizarrely. So as long as there's a little bit of dust around with a little bit of phosphorus, there'll always be a little bit of nitrogen in the, uh, in the uh, ice melt and being deposited out of the atmosphere. Uh, and then it's the duration of the melt season uh, with a lack of freezing overnight, which, 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 tends to, uh, which tends to stop the ice algae from, uh, from multiplying. Yeah. That's, my, so, that's my starter for yeah. 10. I mean, if I just add one sentence, I mean, it, so if the question is what is going to happen in a warming scenario, I guess that we, I would bet my money that they will occupy larger areas of the, of the ice sheet as it gets warmer. Just as an example, Peter, mm -hmm. uh, in 2019, we were in the southwest of Greenland and we found them everywhere. In 2020, we're in the south of Greenland and we found them anywhere, everywhere. So they are not yet appearing on the satellite measurements because those are different kind of things, but we see them on the ground that they are more and more in a moment you get bare ice, you have them everywhere. And it's a transition from the snow to the ice is really, really striking in the south and in the southeast at the moment. Yeah. We want to go next year to other places, but I think eventually we'll find them everywhere. In a moment you get to bare ice domains, they will be there. Yeah. So if I just said a clarification as well that might uh, clarify as well a couple of questions at the beginning there from Julian and Eric, is that these guys are in every glacier. So if you go to Svalbard, they are there. If you go to the east of Greenland, they are there. If you go to the Alps, they are there. So they are existing in all sorts of glaciers and, and ice surfaces, but not sea ice because it's a different sort of uh, different community. But, um, uh, but so basically they are just if they have the right conditions. And those conditions, I would think that it's basically a bare, ex bare ice exposed and then a reasonable number of melting days. Yeah, and we're gonna go up to Tule uh, this coming uh, year, COVID, uh, COVID willing, and we'll, we'll, mm -hmm. be, we'll be on the, on the lookout for glacier ice algae there as well, Pete. So and there's, there's a few more questions. Uh, Steve Warren is up next. So Steve asked, sorry. <laughs> you got my question. Yeah, about the species composition. Is, um, are the dominant uh, types of microbes in the snow different from those in the ice? And if so, why? Yeah. Shall I do or do you do, want to do, Leon? Doesn't matter, go ahead. Yep. So they are different. Uh, so the, the snow algal communities, it's a very different one from the ice uh, algal community uh, genetically and then uh, in the aspect and so on. 
and I suspect it's because of the type of the of the environment, the habitat that they are living is very very different. So there's no algae. We know a little bit more about their life cycle. So they are usually sort of flagellates um, at the beginning that swim through the snow on the top of the snow and then they become a resting stage that become very heavily red pigmented uh, or pink pigmented and so on. So this is one type of pigmentation that's very different from the ice algae. While the ice algae is, is kind of, the habitat is the ice grains and so on. Uh, and the life cycle you know less, but they are they don't have this flagellate phase, for example, like the the, the snow algae. So uh, I think that it's basically two very different communities, and then the and the explanation is because it's two very different habitats. But I think uh, a part of response to Steve to Steve's question is because mm -hmm. I mean you find in many snow environments you don't necessarily always find snow algae because you have to have the melting. So if you have super, super dry snow, you might actually right. never find the snow algae. You have to have the melting and then they will be there. And they are sort of the primary producer in the snow domain. And when the snow goes away, then it becomes the ice algae. So think that there's just very different pigmentation and different process, but the, the, their life cycle is the same. The difference is we can grow snow algae. We have cultures, but we don't yet have cultures of the ice algae. So next we have a question from Martin Sharp. Do you want to ask it yourself? I'll do it. Martin is about 500 kilometers north of me, so he just buzzed it in my ear. Uh, are there techniques in luminescence spectroscopy that could be used to evaluate duration of surface exposure? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know how to answer that, and I'm sorry, but it's a great, it's a great idea. I've yeah. never thought of it, uh, Martin. Thank you. you. Used, for instance, on dating the exposure time of fine-growing minerals on the surface. So I just wonder if the residents time some of these algae long enough that you might actually see some, some response. Well. Uh, I think mm. the problem is a little bit that basically the melting rate every year is so high. Yeah. We have between like two to 10 centimeters melt per day in certain areas that what we're looking at is always the interface is the accumulated bunch of minerals. I mean, I know that there are people using, for example, beryllium 10 to date uh, exposure of rocks on big glaciers, but that's a much bigger different time scale than what we are looking at. But whether we can look uh, at the, that time, at the duration that we're looking at is much shorter. So I'm not sure if the if, uh, luminescence spectroscopy will give us that, but again, I don't know. So the questions from Jack and Ala have been answered already, um, but there was a question on Facebook by David Thompson, seasonal variability in bloom efficacy. Uh, I'm not 100% this is clear. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, explain that very well. I left it out there as a teaser. Uh, it, so Andrew Tedstone's 2017 paper deals with it a little bit. Um, it's about the uh, duration of the melt season, how early the melt season starts. So cold years, uh, you don't get very, very much of a, uh, you, you don't get so long a melt season. It takes takes a long time for the snow to uh, to uh, to melt away, and then you know all things all things being equal, um, you don't get such dark uh, you don't get such dark ice because um, the algae haven't got uh, enough time to glow, grow. So it, it's it's phenomena such as the um, you know whether it's a, a a warm year a cold year, how much snow there was in the previous winter and how long it takes to burn off that snow. And indeed, whether you get snowfalls in August that uh, that close the system down again, so those sorts of factors uh, impact on the uh, efficacy, if you will, of the growth of the dark zone. Yeah. So uh, and then watch out for a new paper coming from um, from Jay's as well that uh, gives some sort of correlation between. Uh, that's more for explaining the geographical variation within Greenland in the Greenland ice sheet, but the thickness of the snow. Uh, in the area before melting to bear ice because the thicker the snow probably there are more nutrients that are being washed into the ice and then that 
sometimes relate to the darkening in that area as well. That's based on the data from the promise stations. So Haiku, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks. So Alex, you said that um, you get ice algae on pretty much every glacier in the world. Yep. And at the same time, Leanne said that you do need melt. So I would like to ask for a clarification on whether you get ice algae in places like the interior of Greenland ice sheet where you normally don't get much melt or similarly the interior of the Antarctica, which is also usually quite dry for large parts. Yeah, so th that's really interesting. I mean, to my knowledge, I don't think people have collected, uh, uh, tried to collect samples from the interior of Greenland below the snowpack on the ice to see whether they are there or not. Um, and I, I, I and at just another day, I was thinking about this, that, well, if, if the radiation penetrates through the snow enough, I mean, it, maybe not all the way with several meters of snow, but maybe a couple of meters of snow, a little bit further in the accumulation zone. Um, I bet that maybe they are there under that snowpack, but really, really in the interior, I don't think ever, no one has ever sampled to, to know if they are there or not. Is that correct, Martin? Leon, do you agree with I that? I mean, they have done the drill yeah. course, but basically, again, because there is, uh, you know, I mean, we had in 2012 and 2016, there was 97% of the ice sheet in Greenland melting. I'm pretty sure they don't exist in the center of Antarctica because indeed, like you said, they are, it is too dry. But I, mm -hmm. the question is, if the, the, the areas around Greenland, at least, they increase melting more and more, eventually they, it will actually become darker. At what scale we get to go all the way to, let's say, summit or in the area of East Creek, that's another question. And we're not talking at that kind of speed, but their spores can travel. So at least in the snow algae, we know that they have spores. We don't know yet about the ice algae. So they actually will survive. And Martin has this lovely dream of them flying up upwards, but we're all been always making jokes about that. But they have to somehow get colonizing the, the next domain. But at the moment, we don't know that. We analyzed some snow from Summit and East Crip, but actually we only looked at the snow and that was just full of bacteria, not necessarily algae yet, because we didn't go, to, obviously, there's no ice there. Yeah, we, um, you know, and this takes up Ian uh, Hewitt's question about, uh, do you know how much of the, uh, of the algae gets washed off the uh, surface into, into the streams? And well, when a, a lot of measurements, and I, I don't necessarily believe them myself, uh, in the, uh, the height of summer suggest that there's very little cell transfer out of the weathering crust into the superglacial, uh, superglacial streams. Uh, you certainly see the 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 uh, algae being redistributed during the early melt season. We saw that that ourselves. And and the the odd thing there, and this is you know set me right, please, Alex and Liana. Mm -hmm. But some seem to be sticking to the ice crystals, and others seem to be forming surface films and uh, and uh, and rafting down the uh, you know to uh, to colonise new environments and. Uh, Liana was alluding to, uh, well, we had a, such a good, good argument, as you, as you only can do in the field, uh, where I, I was saying all the vectors, all the vectors uh, on the glacier surface, the, the water movement, the ice movement, are taking the, the ice algae away from the, uh, the interior of the ice stream, uh, ice sheet, and, and taking them and shunting them off the margins. So there's got to be a return vector. And <laughs> my firm belief is that they should be in the air. And that caused merry hell because I don't think we've, we've, we've collected very many ice algae in, um, you know, in the aeros aerosol samplers at the moment. And then my only counter to that is, is uh, we, were, we were in storms where the you know, the wind speed was 50, 60 knots or so. And the, um, the surface of the weathering crust was being stripped off. Uh, all sorts of things were be being blown around our camp. And I'm, I'm pretty sure, just like you get sea spray 
uh, ejected from the, the ocean into the atmosphere. I'm pretty sure it must happen in those, uh, in those catastrophic events. So I and wonder- And we have to not forget, Martin, that we measure, uh, we collect our aerosol with, on the catabatic wind, so it always comes from the plateau, not when it comes from the, and we don't collect yeah. aerosols at 80, 80 miles per hour wind, we're not doing that. No, I, I, I agree 100%. It's not a, not a criticism. Criti criticism. It's well, difficult because we haven't thought about that because we thought just to collect the catabatic component and not necessarily the, the seaside component because that's another thing which we have to do. But I bet, I, you know, my feeling is they must, be, they must be in the atmosphere and they must somehow survive. And um, yeah, I think, you know, that, that's where I think we'll find that if you look in enough snow, we'll find, uh, we'll find glacier ice algae in snow as well. So I think we've been going on for a bit now. So maybe this is the last question again from Facebook from David Thompson. Uh, he's wondering if there's a seasonal variability in the algal blooms that would bias any albedo parameterization for climate process modeling. Maybe for Martin again. Do you want well, to do I, that? Martin? I might have. I might have <laughs> completely misunder <laughs> completely misunderstood the, mm -hmm. the question as I'm as I'm prone uh, as I'm prone to do. But I, yeah, personally, I think that you've got to know uh, the conditions that promote these these algal algal mm. blooms. You, we need to come up with a recipe for so many days of uh, of melting, mm. so many wind free days where the weathering crust can uh, can develop so much uh, so much so much nutrient so much much dust yeah. and then you know those conditions lead to to uh, to blooms that will lead to significant reductions in the uh, in the in the albedo yeah. now I, I don't think that we're there at the moment, uh, and our hope in Deep Purple is mm -hmm. that, we, that we will understand what the recipes are in different places around the ice sheet for us to be able to come up with something that could form um, some useful parameterization that ice sheet modelers could, uh, could use. So my, so my gut reaction is, yes, there is. My frustration is that I, that I can't tell you what the recipe is at the moment. So if I, if I just said, this is interesting because if you just think about the paper that is coming out from Jason here now with using the ProMice data, is that after you have reached the bare ice conditions, so there's still darkening going on. So it's not just that, that um, it, in that sense, you have that variability in the seasonality because the darkening, so for maybe for most of the time people think about, okay, snow reaching bay ice and that's as far as people go, but there's still darkening process going on. And the average in Greenland, it's about nine days from reaching that bay ice. And then for nine days, you still have darkening in that bay ice. So this was a really, really good discussion. I think we could go on for another half hour, but I think we're, we're losing some people. And uh, while we're at it, I also want to thank Alex and Martin, who in 2018, they were chief editors of the Annals of Glaciology that uh, included all sorts of biological factors together with glaciology. So that was Annals of Glaciology 5977. So thank you again. It was nice. I've never seen Alex and Martin in person, so it was so nice to have these IGS meetings to actually um, see each other face to face too. So thanks again, um, Tavi, for organizing it. And thanks to Alex, Martin and Leanne for a very interesting uh, interdisciplinary talk today. Thank you for hosting us. Yeah, the uh, pleasure is all mine. Yes, yeah, we loved it. Okay, yeah. bye, thank good you. night. Bye. Good night. Bye-bye.